Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Mathematical Institute for another Oxford Mathematics public lecture. My name is Alain Gorielli, and I'm in charge of the lecture for the Institute. Uh, it's great to see so many of you. Uh, just a few uh, point of order. Uh, I just want to point to the exit. These are what we call full British exits. You'll have to be careful. Uh, if you take this one, I think I've seen Boris Johnson trying to hide from voting in uh, the Commons today. So you'll have to step over him if you go that way. Um, today we'll talk uh, about origami. It's a topic that I've always been fascinated. I'm completely rubbish at it, but I always love it. And I've always wanted to have a public lecture on it. And I'm extremely grateful for uh, Professor uh, James today to give a, a lecture on this topic. If you're interested in this topic, and I'm sure you'll be after he tells you all that he has to tell you today, there is another event that is organized by both the university, I think the engineering department, and the British Origami Society. There is a British Origami Society with 700 members. So there'll be an event in September, early September. You can find that on the website of the BOS, as it's called, British Origami Society, uh, where there'll be talk both about mathematics, but also about more the playful aspect of origami. So if you're interested in this, you should definitely uh, go. I just wanted to advertise. Uh, I'll be short. I just want to point out that uh, our Oxford Mathematics Public Lecture, uh, funded in part by uh, XTX Markets, and we are very grateful for the help. It's a a uh, financial company with offices in New York, London, and Singapore. Uh, uh, today, I will not give you a full introduction. Um, I've admired the world of Professor James for many years. I've heard him give many talks. And I've always been fascinated not only by his research, but also what I would call this clarity of thought. There are few people, when you hear them, you realize both that they understand the topic extremely deeply, but also they can phrase it in a way that makes you feel you also understand it deeply. And so I always wanted him to give a public lecture here, and I'm particularly glad. But since he has been a very long time friend and collaborator to Professor John Ball, I thought it would be best for him to introduce him. So please help me introduce John Ball. We will do a proper introduction. <laughs> So it's uh, my great honor and pleasure to introduce my scientific colleague and good friend, Professor Richard James, who is a distinguished McKnight University professor at the uh, University of Minnesota. So uh, Dick James is a, a truly remarkable uh, scientist, an, an undoubted uh, world leader in, in both theoretical and experimental mechanics. And that combination itself makes him unusual. And, and he has a whole string of extraordinarily original contributions over a range of problems in mechanics, mostly centered on, on, on the uh, behavior of, of, of alloys that undergo solid phase transformations, which is a very important uh, practical issue, but stretching into other areas, such as the structure of viruses and parts of uh, statistical physics. Now, uh, Dick belongs to, uh, the, he does not belong to a mathematics department, but to a department of aerospace engineering and mechanics. And though he will deny it, he's also a very fine mathematician. Uh, and I think that uh, one thing that I, I admire of, uh, of him is that perhaps more than most mathematicians who work in, in mathematics departments, he believes in the power of mathematics for describing nature. So silly special cases that uh, mathematicians would ignore in his hands turn into discoveries of new materials. So I think that's a remarkable um, uh, ability to, to, to do that. And so it's a great pleasure to invite him to give his lecture. Okay. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And uh, everyone can hear me. Is it uh, clear? Um, 
<coughs> and it's a great pleasure to deliver this lecture and a great honor. Um, I'm going to speak about, uh, in, in particular, it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to um, speak in this room, this beautiful room with this beautiful ceiling, and also to speak in this wonderful math institute, and um, with its many references to mathematics. In fact, this uh, glass ceiling that you see there has a nice reference to, um, to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian and their eigenvectors. Um, but it also has a connection, a nice connection to origami. So in fact, I'm going to start with a homework problem. Is this, uh, <coughs> this um, you can think of these glass panels as rigid, but I'm going to allow the joints to be flexible. And so my question is, can this be folded? Okay, so we'll, we'll, I'll give you enough information that you'll be able to decide whether this can be folded or not. And at the end, I'll tell you, I'll tell you all about it. Okay, so uh, first a little bit about myself. I come from a kind of place maybe you've not heard of. It's, it's Minnesota, it's in the United States. It's this little red state up there in the very far north. And uh, it's known for these things. You know, people like to take vacations in Minnesota and they, they, they like to go canoeing because it's the land of 10,000 lakes. In fact, there are 15,000 lakes in Minnesota, not, not, not including small ponds, you know. So, we really have a lot of lakes, so almost everybody has a canoe, and they go around in these lakes. So just to convince you that origami and folding has penetrated all areas of technology, I want to show you a little video here that was the, the Ori Canoe Company was extremely pleased that I was going to show this video. But <laughs> You can even fold the canoe up. So if you have a studio apartment, you can own a canoe and you can go canoeing. So <laughs> secondly, I'd like to make an uh, acknowledgement. Um, I, I have a, actually a project on origami structures, the, the design of origami structures. And it's uh, one of the participants. It's about five or six people. One of the part participants is Robert J. Lang. Uh, you may know him from his many books on origami. And um, the, he's an interesting collaborator, um, a very interesting person. And he does something that we are so far away from doing mathematically. He does this. He makes a rhinoceros. So you tell him to make a rhinoceros, and he will make you a beautiful rhinoceros. So he will decide what the fold lines are on a piece of paper such that when you fold it up, you get a rhinoceros. That's what in mathematics we would call the inverse problem. We have no way to solve the inverse problem. And, and in particular, um, you know, he solves the inverse problem in such a way that with a, a great dose of asceticism and uh, beauty and simplicity that uh, leads to these origami structures. So in fact, this, this collaboration with him is I feel like it's uh, working with a, real, with a true genius. Uh, one can say that Robert J. Lang is a true, true genius. Okay, so this, this talk is about um, um, <coughs> origami, but it's inspired by atomistics, which may seem like an unusual place to get some inspiration for folding things, but that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start with the atomistics, and I start there with, with um, one of the most important uh, atomistic structures, a carbon nanotube. It's, uh, it's one of the three forms of carbon that did not get the Nobel Prize that's of lower dimension. In fact, I think it's the most interesting one, or nanotubes in general are, are, are very interesting. And what I would like to do is point out a, a feature of its structure. So I want you to imagine so I put a little couple dots there. I want you to imagine that you're, um, that you're actually sitting on one of those atoms, and you're looking out at the structure. And of course, so what do you see? You see the, the nearest neighbors, and then you see the atoms a bit further away, and a bit further away, and so forth. Um, now you go to another point on the structure. So you're, you started here, and we did this. We go to this other point, and we sit on that point, and we reorient ourselves in exactly the right way, you see exactly the same picture as you do on the first one, okay? And that's true of every atom of the structure. If you, re if you orient yourself in the right way, you take a picture, you see exactly the same environment out to infinity, okay? 
That's interesting. I mean, okay, so the reason I cho chose the two red dots is because it, it, it looks like this can't possibly be true. Because how can this see the same environment as this? This is, so in fact, what you have to do is you know, on the top one you have to look down and the bottom one you have to look up. And if you do, then you'll see, the, that, that's the orientation at which you'll see exactly the same thing. And if you turn sideways, you'll see exactly the same thing. It's a property of uh, that particular structure. But it's also a property of many, many structures, and particularly these kind of nanostructures that people are uh, discovering these days. So here's, uh, so I, okay, first I'm gonna put it in mathematical terms, then I'll show you a bunch of pictures of, I call these objective structures. And so the, let's, let's try to put that in mathematical terms. So here it is, here's a, so you know, I'm gonna think of positions in space, you can think of uh, three coordinates of the position or in two dimensions like this, it's the idea is either case. And suppose x1 is a, 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 a point of the structure. And there's other points, many other points, and I'm not drawing them all, I'll just draw some of them. And now I draw vectors to, to every other point. So this, and so, okay, fine. Now, now I go to another point of the structure, any other point, say xi, and I draw vectors to all the points of the structure. Okay, so I get this spray of vectors coming from x1, and of course, uh, you know, this, the, there would be a vector from here to here, I just haven't drawn it, and so forth. An objective structure has the property that I can take that spray of vectors coming from x1, I can rigidly rotate it, and I can rotate it into, into the spray of vectors coming from x2, okay? That's an objective structure. And you can write that down mathematically. Um, the notation, I mean, I think some of you will understand the notation, I'm not sure everybody will, but uh, it's, you, can, you can read this on two different levels the picture level and the uh, linear algebra level, um, but it's like the, it, it goes like this. So this is the structure, that's the full set of points. And they have the property that for any one of the points, for example, xi, you can take all the points, uh, you can take the, the, the arrows going from x1 to all the points, you can reorient them depending on the choice of i, and you can add them back to xi and you get the same structure back again. Okay, so it's exactly what I said in words, is uh, that's the mathematical definition. And of course, you have a mathematical definition, you can study it, and you can do quantum mechanics with this definition, you can do many things, many interesting things, but what I will show you is a picture. So all these structures are objective structures, and uh, um, I'll tell you about some of them. Of course, these are Nobel Prize winning structures here, graphene and, and buckyball. I've already discussed um, carbon nanotubes. These are the sort of classic carbon nanotubes. This is carbon nanotube with chirality. That's, they're all objective structures. And here's some helical structures and uh, some viruses and so forth. The only thing I should mention is, is like these viruses, that's the bird flu virus. By the way, this is, this is phosphorine, which is also a very, very interesting structure. And again, you might not think that every atom sees the same environment, whether it's on the lower level or the upper level, but that's true. Okay, um, and uh, <coughs> this, this amyloid protein is also an extremely important protein. But uh, <coughs> this is the, uh, one of the bird flu viruses, and you, you, you can see this is made of molecules. So the, the definition I gave you was, was for an atomic structure. And the, the molecular structure, the definition goes like this. Um, you have identical molecules. You number the atoms in, in each molecule, say, one to 100. And then you, you and I'm gonna assume the numbering is done in a very good way, so that I go to the 27th atom of, of this molecule. Now I go to the 27th atom of a different molecule, any other molecule in the structure. And I, I, and I look in a, an appropriate direction, then the 27th atom of every molecule sees the same environment. Okay? So that's the definition. The 26th atom sees a different environment from the 27th, but all the 26th atom sees the same. And then there's a huge number of, of molecular structures which, which satisfy that definition. Mostly I'll do the atomic case because it's a bit, e bit easier to, to explain things, but uh, those, are, those are objective structures. So now we're gonna play a game with the periodic table. Um, <coughs> so, there's a periodic table, and my little game would fail miserably if I included, included these radioactive elements down here, so I, so I erased them, okay? 
And um, I also erased astatine because astatine, there's only one gram in the entire Earth's crust at any one, crust at any one moment, and no one knows the crystal structure. Okay, so this is all about the structure of the elements. Okay, how do most people think of the periodic table? You can open, open a book on atomic structure, they, they think this way. They think in terms of Bravais lattices. Okay, they, they build up the structures from, from Bravais lattices. So mathematically, you take three vectors that do not lie in a plane, and you take integers, coefficients on those vectors, and you add them up. Or in more pictorial terms, you, you, you start with this atom. You those are the three vectors in, the, in this particular case. And, um, you know, and so this, the, this atom can be shifted to this position by, by adding E3. So this, that means this middle atom is also part of the structure. It, and this one is because it's 2 times E3. And, and you, so you take integers, all possible combinations of integers on these three vectors, and you get the structure. That's called a face-centered cubic structure. FCC. You might not think, if, you, if, you, if you're not really quick, like, like I'm not, <laughs> um, you might not think you could get this atom, but this atom is, is obtained by E1, E2, minus E3. So it's uh, integers on those three vectors, and, and this is the face-centered cubic structure. So as I say, most people think of the um, periodic table in terms of Bravais lattices. So I want to, I want to take the periodic table again and I'm going to blacken out all the elements that are not Bravais lattices. Okay, so there you go. So, okay, of course, lots of elements are not, uh, don't crystallize. And I, I, I did this kind of rationally somehow. I, I took the most common structure at room temperature, and if it, the material was not solid at room temperature, I took the structure, accepted structure at zero temperature. So I tried not to fiddle anything, and there's, there's my blackened out. So, Many elements do not crystallize as Bravais lattices, okay? Now, many of those are actually the same crystal structure. Um, about a third of the periodic table, so roughly speaking, half of those uh, black, blackened out elements um, prefer um, the um, hexagonal close-packed structure, okay? So uh, let me explain what hexagonal close-packed is. Um, we, take a, we take a bunch of balls and we put them down in a close-packed fashion, fit together with the closest, the smallest volume, smallest mass in a large volume, say, in, in this array. And now that's, that's layer one, and now I'm going to put layer two. Layer two, I'm going to put um, balls in the holes in the depressions of the first layer, and they'll fit together perfectly, as you see there. And the same, same on the right. In fact, I could, I, it doesn't matter what I, where I put the first one. If I put the first one here, I would still get exactly the same picture. Okay, so it doesn't, doesn't I mean, the fact that they look the same is, is no loss of generality. Okay, now I'll put layer three on. But layer three, I have a decision. And layer three, I could do that. In other words, I could, I could put a ball right in the depression of the previous layer, but not over one of the first layers. Or I could do that. I could put the, the atoms directly over the first layer, okay? And the left-hand structure is, is actually face-centered cubic. So um, it's a little hard to see, but if you go back to the picture before, um, where is it? Right there. If you look down the body diagonal of that, uh, of that structure, you'll see exactly the picture that I show on this, this other slide. So that's this, the, this picture on the left. And on the right, of course, it's something different. And the, on the right is, is hexagonal close-packed. And that, what I mean by that is, is if you continue, now you, you've gone the first layer, so you, you only alternate uh, between two different structures. You might say A, B, A, B, A, B, and you might call this stacking A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. The structure on the right is not a Bravais lattice. So that's why that's, that explains a number of the uh, positions on the periodic table. Um, so why is it, what's the proof it's not a Bravais lattice? Very easy. Um, if you have a Bravais lattice and you have a vector that goes from one atom to, to another, you have an arrow, and you double that arrow, you always get to an atom. That follows directly from the definition. So I'll have a little arrow, and that's going from the center of the bottom atom 
to the center of the layer two atom, the green one. So it's going from the center of the black one underneath there to the center of the, 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 the red one. If I double that vector, you see there's no atom there. So hexagonal close packed is not a brevet lattice. So, but hexagonal close packed is an objective structure. So every atom in hexagonal close pack sees exactly the same environment. Okay, very good. <clears throat> so there's the definition I already gave of objective structures. Now, so now obviously what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the periodic table and I'm gonna blacken out all the elements that do not crystallize as objective structures, okay? Uh, so that's, there's an objective structure, a ring of atoms is, is one example, simple example. So now I go back to the periodic table, I blacken out all the elements which are not objective structures. Okay, there's one. Manganese. Manganese is not an objective structure. It's, 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 it's accepted crystal structure at room temperature is, is not an objective structure. So that's quite interesting, but there's also many, many cases here. And, and um, in addition to these standard crystal structures, boron likes these icosahedra. Carbon is, uh, the diamond lattice is an objective structure. Um, the uh, buckyballs are objective structures. Of course, I already discussed this. Uh, carbon nanotubes, phos phosphorine is an objective structure. Sulfur likes this kind of double ring, which is, and the halogen compounds like these layered structures, which, which also have this property. So you would think that some really smart mathematician would have figured out why this is, but this is one of the, this is one of the outstanding open problems in mathematics. It's one of those problems in mathematics that every couple of years people simplify the problem more so they can try to get more information. And they get just painfully little information. Then they simplify it more. And so now it's the problem of showing that, that with Leonard, with some, some you know, bad variant of, of Leonard Jones potential that, 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 that you get the FCC structure as the ground state, the lowest energy structure. And so, and that's, this problem is called the crystallization problem. So it's, it's really a fundamental open problem. It, you know, why should all these elements which have this, you know, they have very directional bonds to, to, other, to other atoms, why should, they, um, why should they prefer the same environment? It's completely unknown. Okay, but it's a, it's a very good, <laughs> nature loves objective structures, but it's a very good way to begin to, to, to um, be atomistically inspired to make origami. So we'll do that. So I have to talk about isometries. Isometries are fundamental to the construction of origami. Um, isometries, people would use this notation. And again, you can think of this on several different levels. If you want to think about it on the picture level, I'll show you some pictures. And, you can also think of R as a rotation matrix, and C as a vector. And isometries consist of a rotation and a translation. Um, so in two dimensions, the rotation might look like that, you know, um, so just something, and, and the translation may look like that. Um, so that's, that's an isometry, and uh, it's, it's the simplest, one of the simple, there, there are more general notions of isometries, but simplest example. Um, if you have an isometry, you can act on positions in three or two dimensions, depending. And uh, that's, the, that's the, the orbit of the point, or that's the position of the point X uh, acted on by that isometry. So now we, let's suppose we have two isometries. Um, we're going to have R1C1 and R2C2. Um, I, I want to multiply them. And so one of the great things about mathematics is you, you can you can invent your own multiplication rules, okay? So here's the multiplication rule I'm gonna choose for G1 and G2. Looks, looks a bit weird, right? Well, this, this kind of makes sense. I should multiply the rotations. Rotate once, and maybe rotate again. But what's this all about? I mean, there's, oh, there should be a, I, I left a, a C2, should be a C2 right there, so sorry about that. Anyway, makes it more bizarre, anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so what is that multiplication rule? It's, a, it's actually the most natural multiplication rule. It's, it's the, f the fact is the multiplication of G1, G2 is first you do G, uh, uh, in fact, I, I switch them. You first I should first do G2 and then G1. I'm sorry, 
I, so I'm actually showing G2, G1. But anyway, uh, you first rotate with, G, with R1, and then you translate C1. And then you take the result where you are, and you rotate again by R2, and you translate by C2. Okay, so, so, so the, that multiplication rule means exactly this. You rotate and translate, and then you take the result, and you rotate and translate, okay? So it's, in, in mathematical terms, it's called composition of mappings. So uh, it's exactly this, this rule. So it's a very natural rule for, for multiplying isometries, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, there's a, there's a very fundamental notion in mathematics, the notion of a group. It's a fantastic uh, idea. Uh, it always, it it's usually comes up in considerations of symmetry, and usually people would show the platonic solids when they want to describe groups. I happen to be a big aficionado of groups that describe things that look completely unsymmetric. But anyway, uh, if we have two isometries, we, we, we just described, in fact, I not quite described how to uh, multiply them. And you can have a list of isometries. And uh, the, the definition of a group tells you if you multiply any two by this rule, then you get back in the group. Okay? So that's, that's just a closure kind of relation. And, um, and groups have to have, the, the, isome the, the elements of the group have to have inverses. It turns out if, if, if this is the isometry, rotation R, translation C, then the inverse of the isometry is rotation R inverse. That just means instead of doing this, you go back. And, and it turns out minus R minus 1C. And that's with that product is the inverse. And that's the identity. And there's a repository for all the groups all the discrete groups, I won't tell you what discrete is, it's a bit hard to explain, but uh, all the sort of reasonable groups that, um, that can be formed with isometries. It's the international tables of crystallography. And so in, in the library, it's this big, it's online, and you, you can look at those groups um, organized in a bizarre way. But anyway, uh, that's where they are. So um, they're nice to use, okay. So, I, I mentioned two things. I mentioned objective structures. That's each atom sees the same environment. And I mentioned something completely different. Isometries and isometries can form groups. So the point is that there's a, there's a very strong connection. Every objective structure, you, in other words, you could try to make them by do, looking at doing these different environments, but that would be very hard. But this is a very easy way to construct all objective structures. You take a single point, you take an isometry group with the product I just mentioned, and you take, the, you take the, each group element and you apply it to x with, with this rule. G on x is rx plus c if g is r and c. So x is there, g1 of x might be there, g2 of x might be there, g3 of x might be there. It's called the orbit of the point x, which is... Uh, very natural when you see this picture. In fact, I, I made a kind of helical structure, which is an objective structure. And you can get all objective structures that way. So that's the very simple way, is first you figure out the uh, isometry groups, and then you, you apply them to points, and you get many different objective structures. OK. Now, objective structures are very important for, for I mean, uh, <laughs> isometry groups are very important for origami, and it's, and it's for this reason. And there's also an isometry that I haven't told you about, a very important isometry, which, in which the, the, it's not exactly a rotation. I'll tell you about it now. So, so this, is the, this is the rotation, and I, I, let's make the translation equal to zero. So that's a, there's another thing you can do with a star. You can, you can divide it in half by a... Um, by a line, this dashed line, and you can flip it over. You can, you can reflect across that line, and you get this structure. Now, that cannot be obtained by a rotation because of the fact, so you can see this, 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 this diamond this year, and if you rotated to, to this position, the diamond would not be pointing down. So there's no way you can do this by rotation, but it's incredibly important for origami. Why? Because this, this kind of isometry, with this kind of, you know, this is what you, we could call it a reflection, is exactly what happens when you take a piece of paper and you flip it over. Okay? That's, 
that's if I, if I drew some triangles and so forth on this paper, piece of paper, that's exactly, of course, if I, I can flip it over and also move it, I, I can allow a translation as well. Um, so, and those are, those are all the things you get to do in at least piecewise rigid or, origami. Okay, so in fact, that's represented by this matrix. The rotation is represented by this matrix. So you can make a little diagram. I find this kind of diagram very useful. I, I take, imagine this square is all two by two matrices. And again, you can think of this also in intuitive terms. But, and this, this circle, I mean, there, there's just a one parameter. It's the angle of rotation. So as you change the angle of rotation, you can imagine there's, there's a curve in the four dimensional space of two by two matrices that, that, that closes on itself. Goes from the identity, each point on that curve is a rotation matrix like that. It's just a representation, but I find a useful representation. And then you can do this flipping, and that's, this particular flipping is represented by this matrix, but once you flip, of course, just as in origami, once you flip, you can also rotate as well, okay? And it's, you, could, uh, you could say, well, maybe it's more complicated. Maybe if instead of flipping this way, I flip this way and rotate it, I could get something new. No, it's, you, you don't get anything new. You just get this second, second circle. It's one parameter family, okay, <laughs> of uh, one parameter family of, of flips. Okay, so those are the three, three matrices. Okay, so that's, that's fine. So, now, of course, I, I didn't say anything about the C. I'm just talking about the R. And I'm going to allow the R when I do origami to be either this one or this one. And so at the beginning, I'm just going to talk about folding from two dimensions back to two dimensions. In other words, I take the piece of paper, I fold it up, and I put it back into two dimensions. OK. Now, origami <coughs> requires more than isometries. The isometries somehow have to fit together. So we have to think about what, what that means. So let's suppose we have an isometry, let's have the trivial isometry, which is the identity, which is identity matrix and zero. That means, I th that means it, it doesn't rotate and it doesn't translate. So that's uh, the most trivial isometry. And now let's, that's, that's, that's this one. And now let's, let's choose this one. And I want to choose it to fit. So I, I draw a line on this piece of paper and I flip this over the line, that's folding, right? Now, that's governed by, by uh, an isometry, and you can write that isometry down, but it's not any old isometry. But the fact that those two isometries agree on this line is a very strong restriction. That's called compatibility. Now, I'll write the, I'm going to write it as a normal. It, um, if, for people who know matrices, it means that, first of all, the translations don't matter at all. You can always adjust them that they're compatible. The real condition is that the two matrices, the two rotation and reflection matrices, have to differ by a rank one matrix. So this would be, if you wrote this in its components, Bij minus Aij is Ainj. Or if you want to think of it in completely intuitively, then, then exactly the, it's this, it, it's the meaning of it is this picture. But the point is we can put it into, into analytical form. Okay, here's a theorem which, is, which, is, uh, which we should prove. It says that every pair, so you take these two orbits. This was the rotations, this was the reflections plus rotations. And I choose a matrix over here. I choose a matrix over here. And as I say, I can always adjust the, the, the little a and the little b, the translations, to make an origami. But, uh, but it turns out that b is always compatible with a. Okay, proof. We can do this proof with. Okay, so I, <laughs> I take, again, I can, in, without loss of general, I can take B to be the identity, or I could take it to be a rotation and a translation. And now I flip this over, and, and before I push down, I ro can rotate it any way I want, and then I can push down. And that, that construction, <laughs> which is a very simple construction, is, it shows that, shows that given any matrix over there, given any reflection plus possible rotation, and any rotation, any pure rotation, they're always compatible. Okay? 
Okay, and I, I invent a little notation for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a blue line between these two matrices if they're compatible, if they satisfy this condition, or more intuitively, if, this, if, this, if the two isometries can agree on a line. Okay, so now we do the simplest origami, and um, I think what I'm going to do is, okay, so first let me, let me, let me do it on, analytically. So there's R1, I pick a rotation that's uh, doing this. And, um, and I pick a Q2, I pick a reflection. So, and as I say, I can always adjust the uh, translations to work. So I pick, pick a rotation reflection. They're always compatible, because I said any two are compatible. So I can draw a blue line. Now I pick a rotation over here, and it's compatible with Q2. I pick a, I pick a reflection over there, it's compatible with R3. And sure enough, Q4 is compatible with R1. Okay. I satisfied all compatibility. Just I can choose anything I want, you know. And that means analytically that those four conditions are satisfied. And even if you really don't quite understand those four conditions, if I add them up, the two cancels, the one cancels there, the four cancels, and the three cancels. And that means that the sum of the right hand side is zero, and there's some kind of restriction on the normals to the interfaces. Okay, so, so now I'm going to make isometries. Now I'll tell you what the translations are. I'm going to make them all zero, and I can do that because they meet at this point. Okay, now I'm going to do a very, very famous construction in origami. I'm going to take a piece of paper, and, um, and I'm going to just uh, do like this. I'm going to push it, because I'm describing origami mapping from R2 to R2, right? I'm in two dimensions, so I'll just do this. Okay, so you can do this at home. And uh, what happens is, this is uh, parchment paper, works pretty good for this. And you can see, what are our fold lines? So we have a lot of interesting fold lines. We have places that are kind of destroyed, but we also have some quite simple places where four folds come together, like down here, and there's one right there, and there's one right there, and there's, there, there, there's one right there as well. And if you, if you studied them for a while, you'd realize that they, there's some particular geometric relation for those guys. And this is a famous theorem in origami. It says that you can fold this, fully fold it back into two, start in two dimensions and fully fold it back into two dimensions if, if and only if alpha plus beta equals pi. So the sum of opposite angles is pi, and of course the sum of those are, is pi too, necessarily. And there's two solutions, and those are the, those are for, for typical, typical case, those are the two solutions. So that's a, something you see all the time in origami. It's a very, very typical construction if you want to fold from two dimensions back into two dimensions. Okay, and the interesting thing is, is more than that, is that if you satisfy alpha plus beta equals pi, then not only is there some kind of mapping from two dimensions to two dimensions, but there's a mapping from two dimensions up into three dimensions, and isometry all the way, and back into, back into two dimensions. In fact, there are two, exactly two such continuous mappings. There's also two trivial solutions where you fold it and you fold it, but okay, that's the, you can write exactly, and you can write formulas for all the deformations that, that you have. Okay, so that's a well-known thing in origami, but it's nice, I hope it's nice to see in a, in a maybe more mathematical way than you would see in uh, origami books. So here's something that you won't see in origami books. Um, so this is a, so, it, 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 so now we say sum of opposite angles is pi, right? And so I'm going to make a lot of fourfold things, and I'm going to arrange that sum of opposite angles is pi. Can I fold it? So if I, if I cut out one of those little regions, I can fold it. But it turns out I can't fold that, in, or, or I can fold that. But in general, I, I won't be able to. You, you do it on a piece of paper, you won't be able to fold it. So what is the, what is the restriction? It's, the, it's, it's very nice, actually. It's this. So I look on the edge, and I look at these guys, those fourfold guys there. And I, I, arrange, I, arrange, uh, I arrange them to have any, any angles but sum of opposite angles is pi for this point, for this point, for all the points on that edge. And now I arrange, now I pick this edge, 
and I arrange the sum of opposite angles as pi for, for all the points along this edge. And the theorem says, and, and okay, one more thing you get to choose. For each point on this edge, you get to choose a plus or minus one as well. And with that amount of freedom, then the entire fold crease pattern is determined. That's, uh, and these are all ways to fold it. And uh, you can write formulas for everything. This is a particularly simple one, but uh, you may not be able to decide uh, uh, how it gets folded. Um, but that's the situation. So it's very restricted. You, you can't just go ahead and, 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 and put these together in some arbitrary way with alpha plus beta equals pi. You can only choose them here and here, and then the, everything's determined. It's a little bit like differential equations. You kind of assign boundary conditions, and then you, 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 see, the, you see the possible, you, you get one solution, a unique solution, if you, with those plus or minuses, as I mentioned. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what that folds. Now that, that's, that structure folds in this way. Um, in fact, it folds, it folds flat. I just, uh, it just doesn't, the movie doesn't go all the way. Um, and you can do more complicated things like this. So you can, in this case, along this edge, so see those guys right there, they were assigned such an alpha plus beta equals pi in some kind of quasi-random way. And these were assigned along this edge and then all these, all these fold lines were determined, and then it can be folded. Okay, that's uh, okay. So that uh, gives you an idea about that. You can see it again. That fold, that folds flat, by the way. Okay, so <coughs> nature has another has. Uh, there's all kinds of folding in nature. This comes from, This was uh, mentioned by John Ball, but uh, it it turns out that that phase transformations in crystals are very closely related at some level to origami. So what is a phase transformation in crystals and how does it differ from origami and how is it the same? So <clears throat> phase transformations in crystals are, are transformations where, where the crystal structure changes at some particular temperature. Okay, so maybe very often this cubic structure, like this body-centered cubic structure, which by the way, this is a Prave lattice, is uh, the, the stable structure at high temperature and what happens when you reach a, you, you cool this material, you reach a certain temperature, and the, um, and the material distorts. And I just chose one example. In this particular material, which is here, um, it distorts by shortening on this vertical axis. And the top face here, which is a square here, becomes a rhombus. And now you can think by symmetry that there should be actually six ways it can distort. In this, with this kind of phase transformation, and those are the six matrices that describe those distortions. So what are the six ways? So instead of shortening along this axis, I could shorten along this axis, so I could shorten along this axis. And for each one of those, I can make two rhombuses. I can pull it out like this, or I can pull it out like this. And those are the six distortions. So now these are described not exactly like, a, like, like isometries, but quite similar in some way. You, you know, you first have to you first have to distort, and that's the, and you do a linear transformation described by one of those matrices, and then you're allowed to rotate, because of course it's a crystal. It, you you can you can rotate it however you want, and you're not going to. It's going to be equally possible before and after rotation. So but then you can also have translations, of course. So it's a little bit more complicated than origami. We have a not only a rotation here or a, pot or a reflection in a, in a translation, we have also a distortion, but the distortions are discrete. There's only six of them, okay? And exactly the same mathematics works. So <laughs> instead of two of those orbits, we have three by three matrices, we have six orbits, we have this free rotation. This is kind of a, just a representation of, of all the distortion plus rotations the crystal can undergo. And there's a particular microstructure of this crystal. And if you, if you go in here and, and, and you, you, you notice, this is, in fact, this is a very unusual situation. You, you find out that this, this matrix is compatible with this matrix, and this is compatible with this one, this is compatible with this one. The normal case is this would not be compatible back to A. So it's, in that sense, it's very different from origami, but, it, but for this material, it's in fact, it goes right back to A. And that means all those four interfaces are compatible. 
And once you realize that, you can make the whole structure. So, and uh, as John was saying, I mean, these 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 phase transformations are incredibly interesting. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you one in which. <coughs> so you can imagine that, you know, just like origami, if you get to play with those six matrices by changing these so-called lattice parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, you get to change the distortions. Then maybe you could have very special distortions in which the two phases fit together in many, many ways. You've got many, many origamis. So in fact, that is the truth. That is exactly the truth, is if you tune alpha, beta, and gamma to have some special values, then you'll get many origamis possible with these crystal structures. Okay. So how do you tune? You tune by changing the composition of the material. So if the material is... Uh, is some alloy, then you change the composition, you very carefully measure these, these, these and you, you, you go towards your mathematically determined uh, uh, lattice parameters. Um, so, very good. So, that's, that's how you do it. And I, I want to show you a material that's been tuned. It's, this is one of the most, or uh, it, it, there are two sort of spectacular materials. This is, this is one of them that had been obtained by this kind of tuning of lattice parameters so that there were many, many ways to fit together in completely non-generic conditions. And it's uh, fun to watch a movie of it transforming back and forth. By the way, I had six distortions in the case I mentioned before. This material has 12 distortions, but it's very similar, very similar otherwise to, to what I was saying before. So um, this is a movie where, you, where I'm just heating and cooling the specimen. So there's a, there's a, there's a little thin film heater underneath this, this piece of material. It's heating it uh, uniformly as possible, and it's cooling. And one of the wonderful things about this <laughs> movie is that the, every picture is the differ different. So in normal phase transforming materials, every picture is the same, but this particular material somehow has so many different origamis to make that it uh, can do different each time. And this, this particular material is one of the most reversible materials um, that, that's known. As I say, it's one of two materials that, um, okay, to, to explain it a bit more, in that phase, that's the cubic phase, the, the, the boring gray one, you can raise the temperature to, to some higher temperature, and you're always in the gray phase, the cubic phase, but you can cause it to transform by putting stress and, and that's the most demanding test of a phase transformation, is do it under stress. This material will, even though it's zinc, gold, copper, which is uh, never expected to do this, this material can go 100,000 cycles with a stress which would make the steel in this building fail, okay? It's uh, way, about twice the failure stress of the steel in this building. So, um, okay. So, okay, now let's go back to, to, to origami. And uh, let's try to be, um, again, atomistically inspired. And so <laughs> I arrange, I arrange that, that the sum of those two angles is pi. And I'm also going to do it on a parallelogram. So I'm going to arrange that, that, uh, that this length equals this length, and this length equals this length, okay? And you can fold that because it's a... Uh, it's got four regions, and uh, sum of opposite angles is pi. There's the two solutions I was describing earlier. This is partly folded. Um, you, can, you can fully fold it. And as I say, those are the two ways. So if you have that, you could do, so you can think of doing something interesting. So let's, let's partly fold it. So we, we take this guy. We take maybe this guy here. Maybe that's what I did. No, I guess it's the top one. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And remember, after it's been folded, this length equals, equals this length here, and this length here equals this, this length. Uh, in fact, it's down here. The way, I hope it's clear. The way the folding goes, the perspective, but anyway, this, this length equals this one, and this one equals this one. Um, <coughs> you know, isometries per preserve length. So you can imagine, you may be able to find an isometry that maps this line into this line, and this line into this line. Turns out you can do that. It's not that hard. Um, I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Um, and not only that, you can find these two isometries, and, and they commute, actually. So G1, G2 is G2, G1. We're using the same product rule. If two isometries commute, it, you, you can just take powers of them, 
And, and that automatically forms a group. So this abelian case, the, the, the commuting elements is just wonderful because if you take two things of the form g1 to the p, g2 to the q, and you take another one from here, like a g1 to the r, g1 to the s, you write it out. Since they commute, you can switch these two guys. And then, of course, you realize you can switch, you can push all the g1s to the left and put all, push all the g2s to the right. You get something like this. It's back in this set. Okay, so a very easy way to form a group if you, have, uh, if you have the elements commute. So in fact, I can make isometries which both, which both do that, oops, there it is, which both map this side into this side and which form a group. And they, they look something like that. But this, this is some wonderful thing about groups, is, is this, this isometry G1, for example, maps this side into this side. But I can apply it to the whole partly folded origami. And it fits on there perfectly. It satisfies compatibility. And then I can take G2, and G2 fits on there perfectly. And the wonder of a group is that G1 times G2 applied to this original or partly folded origami perfectly fits with all its neighbors. And I can keep going and going and going and uh, make a big origami. So we can do that. And uh, let me tell you about the isometries. Uh, that, that, so we have to be sure that they commute. And they, they, so the, the, the isometries that do that are, are members of the helical groups. And there's a very interesting theorem about the helical groups. I won't go into detail about it. But um, those are the four helical groups. And the, d the details of the isometries are there. But, you don't want to read that. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just explaining to you that you can explicitly write them down. This group, for example, so I explain it by, I take this blue ball, and I take its orbit under this group, and the, the H is there, so H to the P. So and I, get, I get that structure. And in this case, I, I, took, I took the group B. I took the orbit of this uh, under this group. And and I colored, actually, I colored the atoms according to the power m, which could be one or two. That's why you got the colors. And c is, is, is the orbit of, of one of these points, and it's colored according to the power q, and so forth and so on. It turns out that we're going to, the, the, the groups that satisfy the conditions on the previous slide, they, they, um, they commute, and they, um, they can map edges into edges, um, are, are members of this group c. So it's, it shows that, that I can write down, them down explicitly. So then immediately you can just form lots and lots of origamis, and, and there's, that's them. Um, so and this, is, this is one, for example, where the, where the thing is folded, and then you fold it a little bit more, and you, you get this structure here. But you can imagine, you, as I said, you, you apply these group elements, you're building up the structure. When you get around the other side, of course, they may not meet. And so there's additional conditions. And actually, they're quite restrictive, so I, I won't go into detail. Oh, this is a this is a, a bistable case, uh, like I was just describing. You you have a folding, and you get this structure. You fold it a little bit more, and you can get this structure. So it's kind of bistable, and in fact, you can write the solutions. You can write solutions in terms of two parameters, and their their solutions are represented by these dots. These dots are isolated, and that means, in fact, there's a little picture there, so you can get so that's jumping between different solutions. We can do it again here. And you can see you can't continuously you know, morph this helical structure by, uh, by, by any method. So of course, um, <coughs> so that's the situation I just was. So, but it would be fun to morph it. So, so let's, try, let's try another method of morphing. So, and again, we'll be, we'll be atomistically inspired. So this is, a, this is a virus. I actually studied this virus at one point. This is bacteriophage T4. Um, it has a capsid. It has, it's a very complicated virus. It attacks bacteria, um, like E. coli is a, a favorite target. And it there, there's the real thing. It attacks them in the following way. It lands on the surface of the bacterium. And it, 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 these, these, these tail fibers are sticky to the surface of the, of, of the um, bacterium. And these long tail fibers are, are also sticky. So they come down. And, and what they do is they, 
as soon as those come down, they nucleate a phase transformation in the tail of this virus. And the, so <laughs> the phase transformation, and there's a picture, a theoretic from a, from a theory, but uh, quite, quite, a, quite accurate representation of the phase transformation, which occurs in the tail sheath of bacteriophage T4. Inside this tail sheath is a very stiff tail tube. So this is joined very rigidly onto the surface of the bacterium. So when it shortens, it, it drives the tail tube through the cell wall. In fact, it not only drives it through, but it twists it. It twists the knife as it's going through. And uh, then the DNA of the, um, of the bacteria page T4 enters the cell, and then it does its usual thing of replication. So we could be, we could be atomistically inspired, and we could think, OK, there could be phase transformations in helical structures, kind of like the phase transformations I showed before. And um, it's not hard to work out all possible compatible structures which undergo phase transformations. And you're seeing representatives of those there. Very similar to the idea of compatibility. is exactly the same, in fact, idea of compatibility we're using for origami, but it's for two helical structures. OK. So that provides a, a nice way of, of morphing in a phase trans morphing origami structures. We can, have a, we can arrange a compatible interface, and then we can, uh, by moving that interface, we can do morphing of the structure. I'll show you again. <coughs> so this is twisting and also increasing its length. So um, that's, uh, that's all I had to say, except I have to come back to the homework problem. Before I do, I want to acknowledge uh, Fan Fang, who's a graduate student, and Paul Plachinski. They're, they did a lot of uh, important work in this area very recently. But I particularly want to acknowledge Frank Yu. So Frank Yu is a high school student from Wayzata High School in Minnesota. It's near Minneapolis. It's, um, and Frank Yu is uh, 16 years old. And Frank Yu knows all the theory I presented, including the mathematical part. And um, I can show you some nice 3D printed structures that he made. OK, back to this uh, structure in the Math Institute that I've, that I've re-showed here. So it turns out the following is true. There's a four-dimensional space, <coughs> R4. And there's a, there's a region in that space. You can define that region absolutely precisely. It's not even very difficult. And you can take any curve in that four-dimensional region and that will define an origami structure. So that can be folded a huge number of ways. So for example, this is one of the ways it can be folded. You can see it again, I guess. Oop. OK, I guess you can't see it again. <laughs> but uh, there's a great many ways it can be folded here. There it is right there. So, so um, I hope this doesn't make you nervous when you leave the room. You know, maybe you don't want to walk under this glass, glass ceiling, but uh, thank you very much for your, your interest. And, uh, <laughs>